Well, church, listen, uh, I've got, I got money right here, so work on your kids. Help your kids memorize the, the Beatitudes. And so here's the thing. Last year we talked about this. On the 23rd Psalm, I give them $15, but parents, come on. They can learn this. You give them two. That's 30 bucks, kids. 30 bucks. Your parents aren't any cheaper than I am. They can, they can spring for it. So let's get on and memorize that, that, uh, those Beatitudes. Just eight. And so here's the thing about memorizing Beatitudes. And all of you, uh, you can just come by the office and get a card. We've got plenty. Uh, the thing about the Beatitudes, it's another way to pray. Uh, there's lots of scriptures that you can just kind of dwell on as prayers. And, you know, there are many times when I can just kind of calm myself down going, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Just to go over them and meditate on them and uh, just to ask, you know, continually ask myself, where, where am I falling short? Where, where is it that... I'm not being poor in spirit. Where is it that I'm not mourning? Where is it that I'm not being meek? Because, I mean, these ideas, when you begin to live them out, will bless you. That's what Jesus is saying. And listen, I believe Jesus. How about you? I believe Jesus. I like being blessed. Anybody here like being blessed? I like being blessed. But being blessed doesn't mean you got a lot of money. It doesn't mean you got nice cars. It doesn't mean you got a big house. I mean, those are a little bit of blessing, but real blessing comes with peace comes with a sense of mercy, of compassion, of humility, but not humility where you just feel bad about yourself all the time. It's a humility that, that makes God great in your heart. I mean, all these things are so powerful. And so I, I just, you know, in our summer series, I just want you to dwell on these, this pathway to holiness, which is also a pathway to blessing. Last week, we talked about blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, all Jesus means by that is you know on your own you, you got nothing. You, you know on your own you, you can't become what you need to be. But it, through God, you begin to understand that God can empower you to be what you can't be on your own. Now, the second beatitude that we're going to talk about today uh, is a, almost a corollary it's not just the next step, but it's almost just the same thing as uh, Beatitude number one. It's just a way to recognize that you're poor in spirit. Blessed, Jesus says, let's look at it. Let's pull that up on our screen because you could just meditate on this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, Jesus doesn't talk about what kind of mourning. I was telling Susan what Jesus was talking about yesterday as we talked about our sermon. And, and you just, you don't know, some of you know my wife. Some of you don't. But, but Susan won't bear fools gladly. And she thought I was being foolish in this one thing. And it upset me, really. Don't you know I'm, I have a master's degree in religion. That doesn't matter to Susan. Well, and, and she's right, so let me just make confession. So Susan, I'm going, there's a specific kind of mourning that Jesus is talking about here. And it, it's probably true there is, but if he, if he wanted that to be specific, he'd have said it, right? So Jesus says, blanket all out, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And, and I think it's true that as you mourn, you find comfort. Uh, and everyone mourns. If you think about it, you start mourning early. <laughs> Everybody does. I mean, when you fail your first test or, or you realize you're not the great artist your parents told you you were or your first boyfriend breaks up with you or your girlfriend or the first person bullies you, you, you have this sense of grief or your parents divorce even far more dramatically, or you realize you, your grandparent dies, you realize life is fragile, or even your dog. I mean, right? I mean, grief is universal. Grief starts early, and there is a comfort for grief. Now, so, so let's just start there. But I said, blessed are the poor in spirit is a corollary with blessed are those who mourn. That is, they're they're pretty much, I think, 
talking about the same thing. So I think Jesus is talking about all kinds of mourning. Of course, he is. Susan's right. But he's also talking about a specific kind of mourning. I think that's fair enough to say, too. And the specific kind of mourning he's talking about is the mourning over your own sins, shortcomings, and failures. When we take the Lord's Supper... We, we almost always have a confession before we take the Lord's Supper. Um, and, and, you know, I've, as a boy, we used to confess our sins. Uh, and, and, in fact, right before we took communion, we used to pray this prayer. Some of you who are Methodist or Episcopal will remember this prayer. Uh, uh, we do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness but in thy manifold and great mercies. And then it says, We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Um, isn't that a, quite a statement? We are not worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table. Uh, in the Catholic liturgy, some of you are Catholic. One of the Catholic confessions in the deeds that I have done and in what I have failed to do, I have sinned. Blessed are those who mourn. Uh, now, honestly, I really believe that emotional, spiritual, psychological health really is grounded in this. I mean, this is just healthy living. To be able to mourn to be able to feel what you have done to others is critical for your spiritual, emotional, psychological health. Unhealthy people are unable to see the harm they do to God and other people, right? I mean, it really is true. Your capacity to mourn, to see how you've harmed your friends, how you've harmed your father and mother, your brothers and sisters, the people in your church, your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, to be able to see how you've done harm is enormously important. We, uh, as you know, my best friend died last week, and uh, we did his funeral this week uh, on Tuesday. And I, I was going to give the funeral sermon, and, and I did. And Susan and Celeste, Celeste is my friend's wife, uh, talked to me, and they said, Now, John, everybody's going to say nice things about Tom, so we want you to recognize for his sons that Tom wasn't perfect. <laughs> right? I mean, so that the sons don't walk up and say, I don't recognize the guy they're talking about. Is that my dad in there? Because, because their point is not that Tom was a hypocrite any more than anybody else is, or that Tom was a particularly bad person. Tom was a pastor. Tom was one of the best people I know. But I, I know this about people, that none of us live up to the principles that we profess, right? None of us live up to the principles we profess. And Tom didn't either. And, and the thing, the people who were most harmed by that were his children, right? And, and the, reason, the reason I know that is I've got two kids. And one of the difficult things for preacher's kids, one of the things that makes being a preacher's kid difficult is because everybody else sees your father or their, your mother up on stage saying nice things, right? But you live with them every day. Right, And you know that their walk doesn't always match their talk. I mean, that's another reason why preachers should move every three to five years, you know. <laughs> that was a big laugh. <laughs> I mean, even Casey. Casey comes up. My, he's my associate. I'm his boss. Comes up and talks about how cheap I am. But, hey, it's the truth. And my kids know better than anybody, and my Susan knows better than anybody how cheap I am. 
because Susan tries to get my money and I'm holding on to it. In the deeds that I have done and what I have failed to do, I have sinned. And, and that sin has implications. And the closer people are to you, the more implications they have. Um, and, and let me say, you know, I am just, I, I literally am devastated by the number of pastors that I have admired who've committed sexual sin. I mean, I just can't get over it. It just keeps coming out. And I want to tell you something, y'all. I have never committed a sin. I have never committed a sin that I could be charged with. In other words, that would... No, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. I've never committed a sin that get me kicked out of being a preacher. So I'm glad of that. Amen. Yeah, no, it matters. No, don't go plod me off. So, and, and of course, I mean, I'm sure they all said that. <laughs> no, they're all saying that, but... How did I get here? Okay. Okay. But here's, here's the problem with even that statement. The problem with that statement is that's a pretty doggone low bar. Right? I mean, I'm going to feel good that I'm not as bad as that guy. You know, every, I used to, right when it started, when preachers started falling, there was this sense of accomplishment. Well, at least I hadn't done that. And then I just went, my God. I mean, these people are killing us. They're killing me. I mean, their sins are so devastating that they would, a member of their church. I mean, how evil is that? I mean, it's just so devastating. But, but here's the problem. When I begin to focus on what they've done, I get my eyes off what I've done, Right? Because what happens is, who are the people that Jesus had the hardest time with, right? Who were the people that Jesus had the hardest? Were they the Romans? Did Jesus have a particularly hard time with the Romans? No. In fact, he comp actually complimented Romans from time to time. What about tax collectors? I mean, they were the worst of the worst. No, he had parties with them. We'll talk about the woman caught in the act of adultery in a moment. But he didn't harm her. He didn't hurt her. Do you know the people he relentlessly attacked? The relentlessly went after? People like me. Sorry, Jesus. Really? I mean, he were, they were the good people. The people who followed the laws, who didn't commit any chargeable offenses, who fasted and tithed and, and wouldn't miss a day of Bible study or prayer or really acts of mercy either these people are so much better way better than me way better than the rest of us in terms of scrupulously desperately trying to follow God's law Jesus, the, 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 the name of them were the Pharisees and the Pharisees affected all the other Jews because they wanted so desperately to follow the law the problem was they became so focused on doing it right that, that they became mean-spirited they became judgmental they got a hard heart towards people who failed and uh, and it and it made them impossible it made it impossible for them to really receive Jesus I mean they alone were the people who couldn't who couldn't get Jesus they couldn't get him because their hearts were hardened you see this is the importance of mourning Mourning keeps you from having a hard heart. I mean, and, and, and it's easy to mourn somebody else's sins. It's easy to look down on somebody else. In fact, if you find yourself being critical or judgmental of other people, can I tell you it's a, probably a pretty good sign you've got a hard heart? Because you've got no time to worry about somebody else when you're mourning your own sins. Susan and I went to our, our yearly church conference, all the preachers in Arkansas, and leading lay people in the church come together and we have this meeting and I hate it. I hate it. And uh, I mean I like seeing I like seeing people but it's just uh, it's just awful. I can't I can't begin to describe to you. But so I sat there with Susan. Susan and I were sitting together uh, and I said to Susan, Susan, I'll make a bet with you. She says what? I said I bet I can go longer not criticizing anything that's happening here than you can.
All I can say is I'm glad we didn't put money on it. Because after about five minutes, Susan looked at me and she said, you lose. And I went, oh, I did. Because I started criticizing immediately. You see, my unhappiness, I mean, I love my community. I love Methodists. I really do, but it just, something about a bunch of preachers together is awful. But, but really, my willingness to criticize, my willingness to complain is something to mourn. What, what in the world? Why do I think I've got a, a, you know, as somebody once said to me, what, did God go on vacation and put you in charge? Your job is to be the critic. Your job is to set things right. In the deeds that I have done and what I've failed to do, I have sinned. And, and the, great, the greatest sin of all is that hardness of heart, that sense of, well, look how far I've come, and, and looking down on other people. And so it's interesting, the word, the way that, that uh, Matthew expresses, blessed are those who mourn, it is continual mourning, right? It's not just mourning back when you were saved. It's every day, every day to, to fearlessly look at your life and recognize in thought, word, and deed that you've fallen short. And fallen short means you hurt people. I hurt my friends. I hurt my children. I hurt my wife. I hurt my parents. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, a, a great Puritan back in the 1600s and 1500s, a great Puritan said, until sin is bitter, Christ will not be sweet. You, would you hear that with me? Until sin is bitter, Christ will not be sweet. And you, Because, you know, you can easily say, well, John, why are you so caught up in this idea of mourning your sin? I mean, Jesus has forgiven us. Yeah, He has. That's why we hang crosses in our churches. He has forgiven us. He was, he was betrayed by one of His friends who betrayed Him with a kiss. All his friends scattered. They ran away. His best friend denied he knew him. And then this series of abuse. Uh, beaten, stripped, nearly naked. Given a cross to carry his, to his own death. Nailed hand and foot to a cross. Slowly asphyxiated. Worst of all, bearing the sins of the world. Yeah, he forgave your sin. But please don't forget the cost. Please don't forget, He did it not for somebody else's sins. He did it for you and for me. And so His capacity to mourn is so important for you to receive mercy. For you to receive comfort, you got to mourn. Okay. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I want to look at a scripture this morning from the Gospel of John. Because it's the perfect description of what it means to be comforted. What Jesus is talking about in terms of comfort. So let's look at John chapter 8, and we'll start with verse 9. Now, most of you who went to Sunday school are aware of this story. But let me just refresh your memory. And if you haven't heard it, this is, this is again one of the great stories in the Bible to think about. And to meditate on. And to try to get... Try to get your mind around the images and the reality of this story. Jesus is in the temple court, the, the great center of Jewish life. He's in the temple of court. He's teaching. And they drag this woman up. And they, they drag this woman. Men are surrounding her. They have literally have stones in their hands. And they say to Jesus, Jesus, this man, woman was caught in the very act of adultery. What do you say about her? What should you do? Now, they're, they're trying to trap him. And you can see why. Number one, if he says, well, stone her, right? Do what the law demands. He, number one, looks horrible. He's talking about loving God and loving your neighbor, and he's killed her. Number two, that's against the law. The Jews can't kill people, so the Romans could get him. On the other hand, if he says, well, no, don't, don't stone her, 
the law of Moses said you're supposed to stone adulterers. Now, maybe they've already stoned the guy. I don't know where he is. Every woman always asks that question. Where's the man? But, so, I mean, here's this woman. And uh, so, here's the power of a hard heart. Here's how incredibly powerful a hard heart is. These are the best people around. And I mean literally these people know the Word of God. They follow it. They believe it. And yet they're willing to use a human being to torment and test Jesus Christ. They're willing to take a woman in her lowest point and brutalize her to, to make a point. I mean, how wicked, how wicked is that? Who would do such a thing? And dear friends, let's always remember our hardness of heart because religious people can do that. That's, that's, our, that's our most diabolical moments when because we think we're so righteous, we have a right to harm people who aren't. Oh. So, this poor woman standing here, they're all surrounding. And I love this moment. Jesus, it just bends, bends down and writes in the dirt. That's really interesting. What, it, what is he writing? Wouldn't you love to know? Wouldn't you know, love to know what he scribbled? Golly. You know, I, we don't know what he scribbled. But you know what I think he's doing? I think he's beginning to take the focus off her and put it on him. I mean, when we mourn our sins, Jesus is right there. He's trying to help us. It, 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 he's taking the focus off her and putting it on him. And then, of course, you know what he says. He says, the one among you says, yeah, go ahead and stone her. But the one among you who is without sin, let that person cast the first stone. I mean, y'all, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant thing to say. I mean, of course, he's Jesus. He's supposed to be right. The first without, who among you without sin cast the first stone. You see, when you know you're sinners, you don't throw stones. Right? When you know you're a sinner, you don't throw stones. If you're throwing stones, what does it prove? You're good? No, it means you're a sinner. And let me tell you, I've thrown some stones myself, so I know. So let's start here with the Scripture. And I love this next part. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, blessed are those who mourn, <laughs> being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the what? Isn't that beautiful? The oldest, being older doesn't make you more self-righteous. It makes you what? makes you less. Because young people might fool themselves, old people can't. We know we're sinners. Beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the one woman standing in the midst. So Jesus is by himself, the woman is standing there. And here, you begin to see the comfort of Jesus. You know, one of the prayers I hope you have for church, one of the prayers I hope you have every Sunday is, Lord, let me feel your presence today. Let me know you're standing right there with me. Help me to know I'm not alone. You know, one of the things I've discovered in prayer, in Bible study, in worship, one of the reasons I want you to do it every week and every day is because you cultivate the presence of God. And as you cultivate the presence of God, you discover that God's primary purpose in life is just to bring you comfort. It's just this sense of, I'm not alone. I'm, I'm, God is with me. You know, when I was a, a young father, I always envied Susan's ability to calm the kids down. I just made it worse. But Susan could comfort her children. To be held by your mother is a beautiful thing, right? And, and listen, in the spiritual life, um, being a Christian is much the same way as being a child. I mean, Jesus is standing there with her, and that in itself is a comfort. And then Jesus says something to her. It's, again, extraordinarily powerful. You can see it. I, and I love this. When you feel particularly bad about your sins, when you mourn your sins, you can hear Jesus' voice, not literally, but figuratively, saying to you, who's condemned you? 
Who's condemned you? Now, in this case, the woman's in terrible trouble. I mean, she's under such condemnation, and most of all by herself. I mean, what she's done, I mean, I don't know about her, but if I was her, I mean, I would just be thinking about my kids, and I'm sure she has kids. Back then, when you got married, you had kids. I mean, she's sitting there thinking, what am I going to tell my kids, or what's going to happen to my children? And, and so she's sitting there, and Jesus says, who has condemned you? And she says, no one, Lord. And then Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. So Jesus comforts her by just being there with her. And then he comforts her by saying, I forgive you. Uh, I don't condemn you. There's, there's just not, that's not why I'm here. You see, dear friends, I don't say you should mourn your sins uh, continually because you should feel bad about yourself. You, you mourn your sins so you can feel the forgiveness that God offers you in Jesus Christ. You mourn your sins so that you can begin to feel the comfort of forgiveness, of His mercy and His grace. I mean, it's our job as a church to offer the forgiveness of Jesus Christ so that you can begin to live freely. Again, what do you do with a hard heart? Well, what do you do with hard soil? We got a lot of farmers here. If you've got, if you've got some hard, dry soil, are you going to plant on hard, dry soil? Is there anything you can plant on hard, dry soil? I'm sure there is something because I'm not a farmer. But, but I know for sure that in general, if you want to plant something, what do you got to do? You got to plow it up. You got to break up the ground. You got to get that ground broken up. And repentance, um, mourning your sin is, is God's plow on your heart, breaking up the hardness of heart so that God can plant the seed in you. And so when we confess our sins, we're breaking our hearts up so that God can plant His Word in it. And, and as God plants His Word in it, this last part can become true. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. And do what? Go and sin no more. Jesus doesn't just convict us of sin. He gives us victory from sin. He begins to help us break free of sin. <laughs> he begins to set us free from guilt and, and the burden of, of just repetitive sin. Now listen, I hope you know that's true. I'm not as, I'm not as good as I want to be, but I'm not as bad as I used to be. Susan, say amen. amen. Thank you, darling. She can testify. I've got, I've, I've, God has given me a lot of freedom at 62 years old. I'm so grateful. But even in the freedom, I've still got stuff i got to do. I'm still mourning because I'm not where I need to be. But I'm not where I used to be. And I'm grateful for that. You know what? I'm grateful I can tell you. Listen to me. If you'll mourn your sins, if you'll let God plow your heart, and then you start putting God's presence into your life, His forgiveness, His mercy, His love, you will grow mercy, peace, and love. You'll grow the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to be a better husband. You're going to be a better wife. You're going to be a better father. You're going to be a better mother. You're going to be a better single person. You're going to be a better boss. You're going to be a better employee. You will be a better person if you will mourn your sin and let Christ forgive you and begin to plan His Word in your heart and that broken soil. I mean, Jesus isn't tormenting the woman. He's not baiting her. I mean, it's, it is mean to say go and sin no more if that's not possible, right? If it's not possible to do better, it's cruel to say it is. But when we focus on our own sin, not on the sin of the world, when we begin to ask ourselves, God, where have I harmed my, child, my children? Where have I harmed my parents? Where have I harmed the people I love, my friends? How have I put my fingers in their heart? How have I harmed them? And God, help me to know how I've harmed them. When I begin to do that, I, I begin to receive mercy and forgiveness. I can ask forgiveness of them. My, my family life, my church life my life with my friend gets better and then I began to bear fruit 
as God shows me mercy, I began to become merciful. If the praise band would come on out, um, we're going to sing a song about how God, how God has pursued us in love. And, uh, you know, I, I hope you can ask yourself as we sing this song, God, where have I rejected you? Where have in my hardness of heart have I not sought you out? Where have, what am I hiding from you that you need to tear down to get to me? As we close our service, perhaps somebody here needs to come forward and just, just ask God to give you a broken heart. Repent of your hardness of heart, or maybe you don't think you can be forgiven at all. And I, I'm just here to tell you, you can. So let's stand. And as we close our service, would you hear this word? Father, I thank you for what you've done for me. Lord, in my hardness of heart, I've not been the kind of man I should have been. In the deeds that I've done and in what I've failed to do, I've fallen short. Father, perhaps there's somebody here who thinks they've fallen so far that you won't come to them. Maybe there's somebody here that deep in their hearts, they just don't think they can be forgiven. Lord, today, help them feel that you stand right beside them and you whisper in their ear, who has condemned you? Neither do I condemn you. And God, maybe there's somebody here who's gotten hardness of heart. Oh my God, their heart is hard towards their children. Their heart is hard towards their families. Their heart is hard towards the people they're living around. And God, I just pray you'll break their hearts today. Plow them up, Lord. Plow over them with your condemnation that they can know your mercy. Oh, Lord, we thank you that it doesn't have to be this way. That you can, you can grow a harvest even in people like us and make us your children. Lord, we pray that that might be so in Jesus' name. Amen.